to be in medical training in post mbbs and there is an online process it's i think it's uh, 20 pounds uh, a year is that right um and this will give you access to a lot of the resources in the in you know in the in the college i'll explain that a little bit in detail uh, other route is through exams so you give the mrcs exam you become a member you give the frc exams you can you become a fellow and lastly uh, you can apply for a honorary fellowship as well uh, which is probably the highest honor that the college bestows it's usually for very senior surgeons who would like to become a part of the royal college and they apply for honorary uh, frcs and this is just about affiliate membership which is probably the most basic thing that you could do uh, straight away uh, you just go on to the website rcsed.ac.uk you know create a profile update it and you register as an affiliate member i said it's not a lot it's 20 pounds i think of for for a year and you get access to a lot of resources uh, with that so these are sort of uh, what you would get as an affiliate member you would probably get discounted fees on courses etc Uh, you get access to a lot of webinars, etc. A lot of online uh, uh, resources like anatomy, etc. And um, you can get advice in terms of you know professional support, etc. So I think uh, if you are considering uh, doing your MRCS or considering a, a career in the UK, this is probably maybe a good first step for most of you. And that's about me, really. Uh, I will take questions at the end. I'll, I'd like to. Uh, I request uh, uh, Dr. Shantanu Deshpande to now talk about surgical training in the UK. Thank you, Shantanu. Please. Thank you. Thanks for inviting. Uh, I would share the screen now. So basically, uh, because it's a training uh, where we are considering even the post MBBS fresh graduates who are looking forward to working in England. So I consider. uh them as well as well as somebody who has done a uh, orthopedic training in india so what we are looking at is surgical training in uk and the training mostly involves fresh approach to the students as well as somebody who has already had some past experience so i am shantanesh pande i am a consultant in joint replacement surgery uh, and associate professor in orthopedics did my training mrcs in england and has come back and practicing in pune so what we should understand is the pathway that is the most critical one whether training or working as a surgeon in uk you will need to consider these main factors basically getting a gmc registration that is one which is critical and important appropriate visas and permission to work and securing a post which is difficult and very competitive but important so in order to get the gmc registration you have to apply to the gmc with your experience and qualification but to work in nhs in any capacity you need a license to practice and that's what the general medical council is going to give once you achieve or got a full registration then you can apply to uh nearby uh universities colleges hospitals so the training pathway involves foundation training core training and specialty training the foundation training is post mbbs core basically under the two years but in various subjects and there is a specialty training which will end at or after st7 or 8 into an exit exam so the foundation program is uh, well thought and well perceived it basically gives you all the experience or clinical experience procedure experience you need a, to work in a hospital setting with the patients so that's why it is very important to understand 
what the foundation program is and what is the eligibility criteria for it. Somebody who has just passed uh, MBBS and haven't had any experience in the hospital setup, any register or non-register post or training post yet would be better to go for this foundation training. But it is not must that you should get it in UK. You can get it anywhere in your own country. You obtain a certificate mentioning that you've got an equivalent training and that will help you or level you up, go to the core training. So core surgical training is another two year program where you have a four or six monthly rotation, various surgical specialties. And applicants must have 18 months or less experience in surgical fields before entering the program. If you already had three years of training, then you're not eligible, you're overqualified. That's the reason. If you haven't done, if you have just done one post or a couple of posts, then it is better to go get a hands-on experience how the NHS at the hospital level works and then proceed or get an entry into core surgical training. It is, if you look at the entry to ST, specialist training level three to seven, the entry criteria for 2021 is you have to have a successful MRCS exam by May 21. So what it means, basically you have done your core or previous experience back home or in your own country. And you have to make sure that you have passed an exam, which is MRCS, which is a membership to Royal College of Surgeons. Once you have done the membership, then you are eligible to get an entry into the uh, ST3 level uh, or at least you should be able to apply. So we have a full lecture uh, or a session coming up for MRCS, which involves a couple of two parts and exam. And my friend, uh, Dr. Umesh will tackle those questions and will give you more insight into the MRCS exam itself. So after MRCS, once you enter into ST3 level, as you understand, you already have a 24 years of surgical training core competencies is already achieved, MRCS is already done. And that's a stage where you will enter into uh, ST3 training and which will go on to ST8, specialist training eight, leads to certificate of completion of training, CCT and FRCS. ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support, Basic Surgical Skills course, these are all very, very important and especially critical when you're competing at high level to secure a job after your training back home. So make sure you try to get into those trainings or courses. So once you are past your MRCS and if you're applying, you have to make sure your portfolio is good. You have to have a clinical and procedural experience, get a good courses or highlight your achievements, make sure you have participated in one of the clinical audits. So a couple of them, you should be doing some teaching to your students, but make sure you document them, get a training in how to teach. There is a specific, there are special programs into it. Make sure you got some presentation publications and you have to make the interview or at the, whenever you're applying that you have some leadership skills. You are a good team player. Your sports or your extracurricular activity also matters. So there was earlier one of the questions how to get into the system because there is a big competition and it's going to be tough. These are the things which are going to help you because at one level, post MRCS, post MS Orthopedics from India, almost everybody academically is at one level. What differentiates the students is these additional things, activities, experiences that you have achieved that is going to help you in the long run. But always, as I say, mind the gap because this is what you will see when you enter the 
UK. You will hear this as soon as you hit the Heathrow and you are entering the UK, you will hear this announcement, mind the gap. And this is really, really critical to have your own orientation or at your realistic expectation about what you want to do when you go there and what are the low difficulties you are going to feel. So this is very critical. I understand that there are going to be cultural differences. There is going to be a professional and social life differences. It is tough moving to a new country and different environment. So do take time to settle. And mental preparation along with academic preparation is very critical to survive or sail through initial months, years is very important for a trainee or a student who is trying to achieve or aim to go to UK for further training. So just coming to an end of my presentation, uh, definitely NHS is a better healthcare system, has its own challenges and unique problems. So the surgical training there is very, very good, especially in terms of patient sympathy, patient empathy, how to look after the concerns of the patient and decide your treatment plan. So being a surgeon is not just if you see a, a nail and hit it or if you have a operating scalpel operate, it's about the patient as whole. And that's what I understand, what that's what has helped me in my personal surgical life after training in UK to look at the patient as whole from social, emotional point of view, as well as the surgical point of view. So post-training, you would get uh, uh, consultant jobs in UK. You can think of coming back to your own country and whatever you learn, uh, you can practice at your own country. But it is important that you work hard and carve your future for yourself. Try and absorb and learn as much as you can while you're uh, in part of the training and come out as a better surgeon. So thank you. I would hand over to Dr. Umesh regarding the MRSS exam. Thank you. Uttar, can I start? Yes, uh, Shantanu just stops. Yeah, I, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shantanu. Um, I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Nagre. He will speak specifically about the MRCS exam. Umesh, please, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to share my screen now. Okay, I'll be talking about the MRCS exam and uh, I'm Dr. Umesh Nagre. I train in UK, uh, in India, then in UK, finish all my exams and uh, I train in Southwest Thames rotation and eventually I come back and start practicing in Pune. And uh, second thing is I'm examining uh, on MRCS examination overseas, India and even in UK since last six years as an examiner. So I would like to throw some uh, light on what is the MRCS examination. And from the attendee, most of the people must have finished the MRCS exam or about to finish uh, part B or part A. So, so this MRCS exam, it is a part A and part B. Part A is a, a intercollegiate part. It's a five hour MCQ exam consisting of two papers. First paper is three hours. An afternoon paper is two hours. This paper covers generic surgical sciences, applied knowledge, including core knowledge required in all nine specialties as follows. So paper one is applied basic sciences. So most of the questions is on the basic sciences. And paper two is principles of surgery in general. 
So to achieve a pass in part A, candidate will require to demonstrate a minimum level of competence in each paper in addition to achieving or exceeding the mark, pass mark set for the combined total mark for part A. So you have to achieve certain mark in both the sessions, part one and part two. And candidates may attempt to pass part A of this MRCS exam six times. They can give exam six times. So just I will throw a light on the syllabus. It's already given in on every Royal College website, including Edinburgh. Uh, the part uh, module one is basic sciences. Two is common surgical condition. Uh, three is like basic surgical skills. Four is the assessment and management of surgical patient. Five is perioperative care of surgical patient. Six is assessment and early treatment of patient. Seven is surgical care of pediatric patient, management of dying patient, organ and tissue transplantation. And the last one is professional behavior and uh, leadership skills. So this syllabus covers everything what a surgeon need before they enter into the higher surgical training. So there are a few things if you want to pass or crack the MRCS part A, you should understand what is the MRCS exam and which college you have to choose. So people have the lot of dilemma, should I choose uh, Edinburgh, should I choose England? I always tell them, go for uh, whichever college you want to go. Go for the college which has the best support for your examination, your uh, reading material, then journals and everything. So decide the date of exam, giving yourself enough time and good head start over the competition. I always tell people when the students come to me that I want to give MRCS, I always tell them that take the exam date first. Once you take the exam date, you start preparation. If you decide that I want to give the exam and if you don't take the exam date, you will never start preparation. So what comes next is a choose your study resources. You've seen the syllabus, talk to the people who are given the exam like us and choose your study resources. So next step is join various, there are lots of communities out there, Facebook, Telegram, where the students and seniors, they help each other. The students who have passed the exam or just given the exam, they will put the questions, okay, I have gone through these questions. So that gives you idea that what is coming during the exam and what is expectation, what are the answers they expect. Then revise what you have read. Revision is very, very important. It's not like one time I read and gone for the exam because it's a different uh, pattern of the exam. So you have to revise it and hold on to the nerves in the examination hall and don't do the silly mistake. So uh, it's a critical, it's a crucial milestone for the surgical career in UK. As Santanu has mentioned that uh, it's the best thing if you want to enter into any surgical thing, whether it's a cardiothoracic, orthopedic, general surgery, um, any any surgical training, higher surgical like neurosurgery, is best thing to have the MRCS exam, and uh, because that will you are proving yourself as an international graduate equal to the surgical training from UK. So the MRCS exam once you pass is always good. It determines whether the surgical trainee possesses the correct knowledge, skills, and attributes to complete the basic surgical training to progress towards the higher surgical level. So you already proven that. So it's an intercollegiate exam. Initially, long long back in 2004 or 6, uh, they used to do the separate exam, but now it's an intercollegiate exam. It's the same paper in all um, uh, Royal Colleges. So these are the uh, different websites are there for Glasgow, uh, for uh, England, Edinburgh, uh, Glasgow and Ireland. So decide the date of examination. As, as I mentioned, there is held three times a year in January, April and September and with booking close approximately two months before the exam. So once you decide, book a date for the exam, until you don't book the date, your brain will be in denial about the exam preparation. So, so if you are really serious to go for the surgical training in UK, start it immediately. So I always, uh, people ask me that, which is the best time? I always tell them that earlier the better. Once you are doing the internship of your curriculum, after finishing your MBBS, you are really fresh for this examination you have read everything and this is the right time you should book for the mrcs exam because till once you get the mbbs degree you take a date and you give the exam immediately so what book i should read for mrcs exam depends on the when you start you are starting your preparation so work on your weak areas strengthen your basic first because this is more on basic and mix it with the right proportion of mcqs practice every day. So you have to at least decide that, okay, I will solve 50, 60 MCQs every day and you will do it very well. So do many MCQs and EMQ throughout the preparation. Do the group studies, it always works very well. So there are 
theory books, basic theory books are there. You should, you have to read these books, like basic sciences for MRCS given by the Andrew Ruff theory. This is like a Bible, you should read this book. Then there are certain essential revision notes are there like Kathleen Patchman Smith, uh, part one and part two. Then there is Oxford Handbook of Clinical Surgery is there, which is a, one of the best books, small book, but you should read it very well. And there are lots of MCQ, EMQ books are there. There are lots of websites are there. There are like EMRCS, part, past exam, on examination, and you start solving all these questions and solve as many as MCQ and EMQ as possible. And you, the students and seniors, they are help each other over the study resources and important information regarding the exam. So they can help you understand your competition, keep you motivated, and help you with more guidance in your study resources. So they have to join some groups. One month before the exam, stop reading anything new, please. Then focus only on the revision. Stick to your MCQ, MQ, read it, try to answer it, and go back and see your uh, theory book. And you have to do at least one revision before you go for the exam. During the exam day, stay composed, read question carefully, because this exam, you cannot go back and say, okay, I will solve this question later. So read the question carefully, read line by line. Your answer is given there. I always tell people that your answer is given in question itself. So mark the option as you attempt the questions and mark it immediately. So because there is no time that I will mark it in the question paper and then on the answer sheet, there's no time to come back. It's a very time ticking exam. And keep track of time. That is very important. Remember that you have less than a minute to attempt each question. So time is one of the important factor in this. Avoid silly mistake. Keep your sense of work, senses working and don't get nervous. Um, have a good breakfast and stay energized and hydrated. You can crack this exam very well. So once you've done your part one examination, uh, like a part A examination, you go for the part B OSCE. So this OSCE is totally a different exam than the Indian scenario. So you can go on the intercollegiateexams.org.uk. Lots of things have changed. So the OSCE con consists of the 18 examination station. Each station is nine minute duration. This station will examine the following broad concepts like applied knowledge and applied skills. So knowledge, anatomy, pathology, surgical pathology, critical care, and surgical sciences uh, uh, stations will be there. In skills, there's a communication skill in giving or receiving examination. Then there is a history taking, and there are certain stations for the clinical and procedure skills. So part B, intercollegiate exam is an objective structure clinical examination. So in applied knowledge, as I mentioned, there are five stations for surgical anatomy and surgical pathology. Applied surgical science is critical station, critical care, there are three stations. So in applied knowledge, there are eight stations of 160 marks. And in applied skill, there are 10 stations, which are 200 marks. So clinical and procedure skills, there are six stations are there and communication skills, they will mix and match. But there are four stations are there where there are sometimes you are giving the information of, of any surgical procedure, you are receiving certain information or your history taking, you are gathering some information from the relatives or giving some information or taking history. So there are they are looking for the communication skills in that, which has a maximum uh, weightage in this examination. So there are certain changes happen if you go on the website because of this COVID. Uh, that all the Royal Colleges has proposed to the GMC that reduce the number of procedure skills station from two to one. They reduce the number of history taking session from two to one. Reduce number of anatomy station from three to two. Reduce number of pathology station from two to one. So the overall number of stations from 17 will go down to 13. And this reframe of physical examination station to allow them to deliver without a patient or actor present by focusing on identification or discussion of signs and symptoms with the examination uh, examiner. And there will be discussion followed by the what is diagnosis and what are the further investigation. But we are still waiting for this. So you have to keep update on the intercollegiate MRCS examination website, which I mentioned just now. That is very, very important because they will be doing the exam in May, July, and October. This is about the part B because there was no exam in February. So they're thinking of reframing the procedure skill station to allow to be delivered without actor present there or remotely if necessary. We have to get the guidelines. We are still waiting for guidelines and introduce the single pass mark for the entire circuit rather than separate marks for knowledge and skill component. Uh, so you have to keep update on this website and look for their announcement. 
whatever changes are there royal college will be uh, communicating with you through email through letters how the exam will be conducted and they are learning for this they are thinking of running this examination with maintaining the social distance in person however if this is not possible then uh, to be delivered remotely using a bespoke video conferencing software so the candidate will be sitting in india they will have the internet and video access and a laptop on laptop and they will do the examination but this is not decided yet and candidate will be informed the method of delivery when they will re receive this communication letter from the um, examination department so uh, uh, we will we thought about we discussed about the examination so what the gmc domain are checked during this whole process clinical knowledge and its application clinical and technical skills communication and professional professionalism is very very important there are certain books are there i mentioned here they are not like a standard books but we have gone through this and the knowledge and uh, everything is given very well in that so doctor exam book is there revision guide for part uh, oski part b and there is one more book for the clinical examination and communication skill main thing in part b is practice you have to practice 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 and you have to read and you have to read a lots of books anatomy these are the books mentioned here then there is surgical critical care by mazhar kanani and simon lemi then the surgical critical viva is also there by mazhar kanani physiology the there are viva books by mazhar kanani and marian elliot and martin elliot and the pathology there is a book by david low which is like a bible for pathology viva the main part is practice at every opportunity you see patient you present to your senior colleague catch hold of your consultant and tell them that i want to do i am giving this examination i want to do the viva practice so you will understand where where you are making the mistake and its deliberate practice is very very important listen to what you are saying and then think over it if there is a communication skill station is there if you are collecting exam uh, information from patient so you have to show the empathy sympathy then your body posture see lots of small small things are very important where we are marking you during the examination so prepare study groups don't study to uh, like just alone prepare study groups it's the best way to practice because you can give the feedback to each other you can learn from the other people and you can revise and prepare uh, for the specific scenario also definitely do a mrcs viva course which are is available close to you there are lots of courses in uk i have done st thomas's course i still remember that long long back and but they will guide you and you get that tempo of examination when you go examination you are not worried and you know what you are going to ask in examination so do those courses in india also there are lots of courses are there so in summary don't underestimate the communication skill element of the examination even if you think you are a good communication skill it's, it's we are very critical as a examiner in your communication skill because you, we need to make sure that you are safe into the medical practice you are safe into the surgical training and make sure you know your game how to pass the exam deliberate practice at every opportunity is very very important and again remember your communication skills are being continually assessed use it as your advantage because that is the one we mark it everywhere in all stations thank you Thank you, Mudda. Thank you, Catherine. Ah, thank you, Umesh. Thank you very much. Uh, very comprehensive. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Clark now. Um, Mr. Clark, can you hear me? Can you unmute, yes, unmute yourself? Yes, I can. Hi. I can hear you. Hello. Um, should I? Should I? I've got your presentation. Should I screen share on my computer? Would you mind if that's okay? And I'll prompt you to to uh, to Please, change. Yes, yes. I'll just uh, just tell me if this is okay. I'll say next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see this? Not yet. One second. Sorry. Go to the share your screen. One second. I'm just trying. Uh, one second. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, now. I think it's coming. How do I? Um... Yes, you can see. Yes. That. One second, one second. Just one minute. 
No, this is this is just just give me one minute. Just just give me one minute. Just give me a minute. Sure. Hmm. <clears throat> this this one this one. Nearly there. Yeah, one sec. Okay. Is that okay, Stuart? Yes, that's okay for me. I'm fine. I'm all okay. right. Alive. Yep. I'm just going to mute myself. Uh, just tell me when to, just prompt me when you want to turn. Yeah. yeah? Will do. Lovely. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I Sorry, I've had some technical issues at, at my end. So uh, I thank you very much for bearing with me. And thank you very much, Mataza. Uh, for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, I've listened to um, parts of the past two uh, talks. They've been very comprehensive and I think uh, uh, I may touch on a, a lot of what's been said already, but I, I hope it will uh, supplement and, uh, and, and help everybody who's listening in terms of training and, and the examination from the UK. Uh, uh, I have a slightly different talk in front of me, so I will fill in at various gaps uh, uh, of slides that, that you won't be able to see, but Murtaza will uh, has kindly help uh, ask me to, uh, to help you through this. So uh, I'm Stuart Clark. I'm Dean of the International Postgraduate Deanery of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. I'm a council member and trustee uh, of the uh, uh, Edinburgh College. I, I host, supervise, and examine regularly in MRCS, both in the UK and abroad. Uh, and in the day job, I'm an oral maxillofacial surgeon in sunny Manchester. Um, sunny is obviously said with a wee bit of tongue in cheek. Uh, next slide, please, Mataza. Next slide. Lovely. So I'm going to talk about the UK surgical training first with a bit of an exam component to it um, in the sense of um, uh, in the UK you qualify in medical school after five years uh, of training and then you go in through a national selection progress, uh, process for foundation training. That's a two-year uh, essentially old house officer type post during, during which you will gain what's called foundation competencies. Once you've uh, uh, achieved those competencies over a two year period, if your chosen career is surgery, you will then apply through national selection to go into what's called core surgical training. This is a, a, in, in old uh, money, as it were, uh, the old SHO jobs of basic surgical training. This involves two years of core surgical training, CT1, CT2 is, is what is commonly called, or there are now what's called run through uh, training posts. So somebody can now, now in, in some specialties, uh, what I've cited there is cardiothoracic, maxillofacial surgery and neurosurgery, for example, you can start your specialist surgical training as an ST1, uh, rather than doing core surgical training. More uh, of the surgical specialties are, are uh, starting what's called specialty training, but there is this two year basic period of time where you're, you're learning the basic surgical skills. The vast number of people will do it through core surgical training. Next slide, please. <coughs> Next slide. Lovely, thank you. Um, so this, this, is what, uh, this briefly is what's required for 
to, for entry into core surgical training. So this is what the UK candidates uh, have to do. And this would be what, what you as, a, as, a, as an international candidate would have to achieve. Um, it's, it's quite demanding. And obviously the, um, the uh, 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 training requirements are very uh, competitive. This year for core surgical training, there are approximately 600 posts in the UK, uh, of which there are 2,500 applicants and about uh, 1,100 people were interviewed for the 600 posts. So I'm, I'm illustrating this in terms of if you are trying to uh, think of coming to, uh, to the UK to enter into what is the established UK training pathway, it is, to be honest, it is very difficult for you, whether that be at the foundation level or the core surgical training level, because it is very competitive and it is very much geared towards those people who are uh, already in UK practice. So it, it is possible obviously for foundation level and for core level, but it is very difficult. The, uh, the uh, uh, email website that I've noted there, Course Surgical Training CT1, that, that was where you'll have a, a comprehensive a rundown of, of what's uh, all, what the eligibility requirements are. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm using that to highlight that to you, uh, but also emphasizing that it's, it's not straightforward for a non-UK uh, uh, graduate. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> next slide. Just give me a minute. So, sorry, I didn't mean to be impatient, sorry. <clears throat> um, the yes, the next slide, specialist surgical training. Now, this is probably of more interest to you, I suspect, as international graduates, in the sense of as has already been hinted at already, uh, MRCS is a uh, or an equivalent to an MRCS is, 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 is uh, mandatory for entry into specialist training. So passing your MRCS part B is critical for this step. Again, it's national selection for each specialty, whether that be cardiothoracics, general surgery, vascular, whatever. The selection occurs either once or twice per year it can be very competitive. The number of jobs in each specialty vary from year to year, according to the vacancies. Uh, it's throughout the UK, whether that be London, Southwest, Scotland, Northwest, wherever. They are usually five year training programs. There can be fellowships within those. Uh, you can do specialist knee fellowships or specialist uh, urology fellowships again, for example. And during that five-year training program, you have what's called ARCPs. ARCPs are assessment uh, of progress, uh, and those have to. That uh, is where your trainers, through the deaneries, assess that you're making progress in your training program. Towards the end of that, you will sit the exit examination of FRCS in your chosen specialty, and this is awarded by the Royal Colleges. And at this stage, you affiliate to one of the four Royal Colleges, at the end of which you have an FRCS and a Certificate of Completion of Training. That's what's called a CCT. Now those are, I say, it's specialist training, I think that is going to be, a, is, is, is more of a, an area where you might get into. Um, and this is where the, uh, the deanery, the International Postgraduate Deanery can, can help you in terms of uh, a training within the UK. Next slide, please. I was gonna have a quick word on clinical attachments uh, because obviously that's something that uh, uh, we see a lot of in terms of uh, people from, the, uh, uh, from a, uh, uh, our international colleagues coming. There are pros and cons to these. Certainly it gives you an exposure to the NHS and to UK culture, and that is good because rarely do, do um, uh, clinicians from abroad uh, have uh, problems 
in terms of uh, when they come to the UK through the, the General Medical Council. Uh, it's much more related to the culture of the NHS and, and the UK where people encounter problem, problems. It's not clinical. Obviously, it gives you clinical experience and it allows you to build up contacts in the UK, which can be uh, very useful to you in terms of uh, progressing your career, as well as uh, creating friendships that will be lifelong for you. Obviously, a clinical attachment will also be of help in your application for your PLAB visa. The cons against clinical attachments is actually there are a very little value in your CV or in your job application. So from that point of view, a, a clinical attachment is more trying to get in there rather than actually uh, and, and hoping uh, that you'll create a contact that will allow you to get uh, your foot in the door. But it, it, it doesn't actually uh, help you a lot in terms of your CV. This is obviously of limited clinical exposure because uh, you're, 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 what you get to do will be very limited in terms of any operating, uh, very much an assistant at best. Uh, yes, you might see patients in clinic, but everything is heavily supervised. And obviously there's expense involved in a, a clinical attachment and coming to live in the UK, but uh, and without earning any money in such, in such a post. So that's just, I say, clinical attachment, something that we uh, know a lot about or hear a lot about, but just to be wary of its, of its value. There are pros certainly to it, and cons certainly to it. Next slide, please. So uh, as it's already been touched upon already in terms of the examination, so, so I'll try not to repeat everything that's, that's been beforehand, um, but MRCS, I say critical examination for entry into specialist training and specialist surgical training. Uh, Edinburgh, obviously of which I'm uh, uh, a council member, it's one of the four colleges. It doesn't make any difference at all which college you, you uh, uh, affiliate to for your MRCS. Um, so from that point of view, it's wherever is convenient for you, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it's Edinburgh, England, Glasgow or Ireland. As has been uh, mentioned already, uh, it's, it involves two parts, a written part and a practical part. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. The original exam, I think, uh, has already been touched upon already in the sense of two papers, uh, five hours, sat concurrently ar around the globe, four and a half thousand candidates from all four colleges. It, it, it's it's uh, on paper or sometimes done electronically nowadays, obviously, and you must pass part A to, uh, to progress to part B, you have a maximum of six attempts at part A before you go on to part B. Next slide, please. Um, the ne uh, next slide is, is essentially um, uh, what's involved in part B. Uh, I think we've touched upon this already in the sense of it's 17 stations. Pre-COVID, it was 17 stations uh, where and it was split into uh, two parts, essentially uh, applied knowledge and applied skills. Um, uh, you had to pass both of those sections, applied knowledge and applied skills, and has already been stressed already, communication is an important area that is assessed in every single uh, uh, one of those stations. Uh, so 18 stations, nine minutes duration in each station. Uh, those are the four domains that are regularly marked. And as the, that was the examination pre-COVID. Now, uh, next slide, please. COVID changes. Uh, it's entire. So as has been said already, as a result of COVID, the examinations that were held in November of last year 
in the UK and the examinations that will be held in May of this year in the UK uh, have 13 stations. There is no examination of patients. There is no prosections. So there are no uh, prosections for anatomy, but they will be, there will be uh, uh, photographs uh, to, uh, for you to identify uh, various structures on specimens. Other changes is that previously there was one minute between each station. That has been extended to two minutes. So that's a, that's a lot more time between stations for candidates to get to uh, uh, relax from the station that they've just been to, uh, to be able to find the next station, to compose themselves uh, uh, before starting to read the next question. So that's increased to two minutes between stations and that has been, uh, that's, that's something that's been appreciated by candidates as well as examiners. Obviously in that period of time, the stations will be wiped down uh, so that uh, the, you're minimizing obviously the potential transmission of any uh, COVID related diseases or COVID, sorry, related diseases. There is now an overall pass for uh, the, this exam. You don't have to pass the two separate entities, as I said, as, as a, of applied knowledge and applied skills. It is an overall pass, but it is still split into two circuits. One circuit of uh, seven stations, another circuit of uh, seven stations, but obviously one of those is a rest station to accommodate for the full 13, uh, 13 stations. So it's still two circuits, an overall pass, two minutes between stations, and it will involve 13 stations. As I've said, this is for the examinations in May. It has not been determined as yet whether the examinations that will be completed later on in the year, so we're talking about uh, uh, hopefully from September onwards, that, that will be international, uh, back to the international style of examinations. It hasn't, or exam, uh, international venues, sorry. Um, it hasn't been determined whether it will revert back to the 17, 18 stations or stick with the 13 stations. That is still to be decided. Um, it has been shown statistically that 13 stations was on a par with what, uh, with what the old examination uh, provided. So, uh, and as I said, there are changes in the COVID changes that have been very beneficial. So what is going to happen later on this year for MRCS Part B is undecided in terms of its format. It still could be 13 stations. Uh, uh, it could revert to 18. Two minutes will certainly stay because that was being shown to be a value and it's as will two circuits. So a little bit of uncertainty there, but that's, that's how it is, I'm afraid, for the moment. Next slide, please. It's just, this is just a list of surgical examinations that are undertaken by uh, the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. Uh, just, so just to bear in mind, there are diplomas there that you can see, fellowships that you can see there that, you, that could be of value to you in terms of supporting your career and giving your career credibility. Um, uh, obviously, I've focused a wee bit on the MRCS because that's, that's an important one uh, for the, your career as a whole. But uh, just to bear in mind, there are others that would be of use to you uh, in terms of your surgical careers. Next slide, please. So in terms of the training side of things, and this is where uh, I'll, I'll, for the rest of the, the talk, really essentially talk about the International Postgraduate Deanery and how that may be of help for you to come to the UK to attain training in the UK for up to two years and for you to take those skills back to your home country. So we in Edinburgh have been undertaking this for over 25 years. It's, it's gone through a number of different titles in terms of overseas doctors training, uh, uh, International Magical Graduate Scheme, the RISP scheme, which uh, we in Edinburgh uh, developed in September, last, uh, September 2015. And overall, we've trained more than a thousand international medical graduates. Now to simplify and refine and uh, rationalize the schemes that we, that we as the Edinburgh College have run, 
we've uh, uh, amalgamated them into what we call the International Postgraduate Deanery, which commenced in May 2019. That was a very successful uh, amalgamation of things that was obviously a wee bit uh, interrupted over the course of the past year, um, but uh, it's, it's now fully back on scheme in terms of accepting, we, well, we never stopped accepting people, but obviously the, the train was considerably uh, restricted by what we could provide as a result of the COVID uh, situation. Next slide, please. The role of the deanery in this, as a, in terms of comparison with UK training, as, a, as you see on the left there, UK training overseas by de overseen by deaneries, provided within hospital trusts, training post deanery approved by, uh, provided by trainers with a learning agreement. In the international deanery, the UK training, training is overseen by the deanery, so very similar to UK training, provided within a hospital trust, so very likely within one trust, uh, certainly for one year. Some people change for a second year, but it's, it's, it's usually only in, in the one trust. It's a training post that's approved uh, by the deanery. It is again provided by trainers in exactly the same way as UK trainees uh, have. And it's also a learn, there's also a learning agreement involved in this where you, the trainer and the trainee agree on what you can uh, achieve during the course of your uh, stint in that, uh, in that hospital, in that training environment. So it is very similar and comparable to what UK trainees get. We emphasize that it, by joining us uh, through this uh, de deanery, scheme, deanery training scheme, that you are to be trained. You're not there just to perform a service commitment. You're there to be trained and gain skills. And that is a strong emphasis that we put on this. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the international deanery, what's it look like? I said, it's an opportunity to hone your skills. Uh, uh, to be eligible, there is eligible criteria that's on the website, but essentially you have a, an eligible MBBS, MBBS, a postgraduate degree in surgery equivalent to an MRCS. It doesn't have to be an MRCS. It is often an MS in India. It can be an MS in Sri Lanka. It's uh, for those Australian uh, backgrounds, it can be set four, set five. The posts are in subspecialty trainings, for the, so that's from ST3 onwards. Now it can be a, a, at a relatively junior level uh, that you can get the training, depending upon your experience. It can be at a very advanced level. Certainly there are a number of advanced training opportunities, let's say in robotics, for example, in neurology. The training is available throughout all the 10 specialties, um, although the most of the the posts are obviously in trauma orthopaedics, uh, urology and general surgery, but there are a limited number of opportunities in the smaller specialties such as uh, maxillofacial surgery or plastic surgery. Uh, the positions are for 12 to 24 months. And I say it's a, there is an important part of this is the learning agreement where you agree what you will provide to the unit and the trainer will agree what he will provide to you in terms of a training experience. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, uh, that's a, a flow chart. Sorry, it's maybe a little bit unclear, but essentially a, a number of common steps uh, on training route one, what happens is that uh, the, tr uh, the uh, uh, trainee coming from abroad has already established a contact and got a post. Uh, and we, uh, as the deanery, facilitate that post with you through the GMC and your visa applications. The training route two is where you, uh, the uh, candidate or trainee doesn't have a post in the UK. And we, as the deanery, try to match you uh, as the uh, trainee with a post in the UK. So, for example, if you specifically wanted to come to get orthopedic training, in uh, spines, for example, we would endeavor to find you a post in that, uh, in that subspecialty, or, or you may have already made, uh, made contacts. So it'd be training route one if you've already got the post or training route two if you'd like the deanery to try to find you a post. Undoubtedly, most of the people that we 
uh, see through the program have, 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 have already established a post. So it's training route one is, the, is a long, by a long way, the more popular route. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I said, it's it's a it's it, uh, the deanery is a combination of the two previous uh, uh, schemes that we ran. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on quality assurance, uh, and we aim to have identical quality assurance to each trainee, regardless of how they're appointed. We do put a strong emphasis on an induction to the NHS and UK practice, because as I've already hinted at already problems that people, uh, international graduates have is very much more related to culture and NHS practice than actually clinical expertise. Clinical expertise, uh, your, the, the skills that you have are very comparable to uh, many UK trainees. So it is rare that the, the, any problems are right, arise out of clinical uh, acumen or clinical, clinical um, ability. There is a there is a cost involved in this as a as a as a fee de, uh, depending upon uh, whether the dean refines the post or we facilitate the the post that you already have. At the end of all this, you get a, what we call the membership of the international postgraduate deanery. So these are post nominals that you can place at the end of your name after your training uh, period, M I P D E D, uh, and you will be invited to come to Edinburgh to uh, to receive these post nominals um, uh, given to you by the president currently Mr Mike Griffin. During your period of time you will be an affiliate of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and that will give you many opportunities to enrol upon courses, come to Edinburgh to be involved in educational events uh, as well as actually uh, allow you to stay in the Edinburgh Hotel and see the college itself and, uh, and uh, obviously the sites of Edinburgh. But it does about allow you access to uh, the uh, the uh, facilities of the college. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, to be eligible to, to work in the UK through the International Postgraduate Deanery, as, as you gather there, the eligibility, eligibility involves, you must not be a resident of the EU. Now, as a result of Brexit, actually, we will be allowing people from the EU to come into this scheme. But this scheme is very much for uh, those people who do not come from affluent countries. So, uh, so from that point of view, uh, the GMC will allow us to appoint uh, many people from uh, the Indian subcontinent, Africa, uh, Asia. Um, there is a limited number of availability for those people from the EU or from Australia. Um, so there is a there, there's going to still remains a bias towards uh, accepting people from uh, uh, underdeveloped countries. You must have a, an acceptable undergraduate qualification. As I've said, you must have an MRCS or comparable. You must have an IELTS score of 7.5, an OET of B. You must have been in clinical practice for 12, the last 12 months, as well as three of the last five years. The GMC are quite uh, um, uh, strict upon this. Uh, they will allow a month, I think in the past uh, three to five years or uh, a month uh, transition in the last 12 months. So for example, if um, you've been on holiday maternity or anything of that sort, but anything much more than three or four weeks, they will not uh, allow your application to be to proceed. So that, they're quite strict upon that. The support that we will give you as the International Deanery will involve um, uh, sponsorship for the GMC, uh, support with your visa, uh, will uh, as they, uh, give you the RCS affiliate network. We also help you with access to a banking, uh, a banking account in the UK. As, as I've stressed already, we will help you with induction into UK practice uh, in terms of what's been said already, communication, uh, 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 a session with the GMC, so that so to help you with the uh, things that you might be slightly unsure of in terms of UK practice. Next slide, please. Um, uh, in terms of life in the UK, what's what's involved in this? The salary of these posts obviously varies upon the level, and it varies upon the banding. The banding is essentially 
uh, how busy your on-call commitment is. But the salary is approximately £45,000. That's a take-home of £3,500 per month. And from what the currency converter told me, that's, that's approximately 350,000 rupees per month. Uh, so that's the salary that you will uh, uh, receive depending upon the level that you go into. And I'd say the banding, which is the, uh, the, uh, the busyness of any on-call commitment. Uh, accommodation can be expensive, particularly in London. Uh, which, as I say, we're talking about twelve to fifteen hundred pounds per month. So you could readily see uh, more than a third of your salary uh, going on accommodation alone. Travel, excuse me, travel in in London. You're unlikely to have a car because uh, 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 because a car is of, of no specific benefit in London. Uh, but uh, you're still talking about travelling to and from work will be approximately seventy five pounds per month. If you're obviously not in London and you're more peripheral, you're more likely to have a car, but just bear in mind the expenses involved in that in terms of tax and insurance and the like. So that's roughly what to expect in terms of the salaries and, uh, and the like in the UK. Food can be inexpensive. It can also be very expensive depending upon uh, what you choose to eat, um, but there are, food can be very inexpensive. And from what I gather, um, uh, a lot of people can save uh, uh, through the salary that they receive, but you've got to be, I suppose, what we call in Scotland, a wee bit canny about things in terms of um, uh, make the best use of your money. But uh, as I say, it, you do get paid and that's the approximate salary that you will get. Uh, next slide, please. Coming to the end. So how to apply, uh, you go on to the uh, Royal College of Surgeons uh, in Edinburgh website. Uh, if you look up sponsorship, uh, there's uh, that's that's one access to it. Uh, the other access can go to the website and just look up International Postgraduate Deanery through the search facility there. As I've said, the, the two training routes, if you found a post or you're seeking a post, you submit a copy of your CV and an operative summary of the last 12 months. That, uh, that gives any prospective uh, a trainer or employee uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a means of ensuring that the post that you will go to will be suited to you and that you will get trained in, in that post. And the deanery obviously will, re will reply with a full application pack uh, and, um, and what's required and obviously endeavour to help you in terms of uh, any way we can in, in your, your training. The next slide please is the last slide. It's a wee bit busy. Um, but it does give you some uh, uh, email addresses um, in terms of the International Postgraduate Deanery. Uh, the second one there is what's required for foundation training. The, th the third one there is core surgical training, one I've hinted at already. And the last one there is specialty training, recruitment, the person specifications involved in those. So that's a busy slide, but it does show you the various means of entry into training in the UK whether that be immediately after your uh, medical degree, after you've done your uh, foundation training, after you've done your course uh, uh, surgical training, or entry into specialist training. I say that those are for what's required for entering in a UK training programme. The International Deanery is here to help you to get um, two years of uh, proper training for you to take your skills back to your own country. I'm happy to take any questions as, as best as I can through the, uh, the, the facilities that uh, Mataz has kindly helped me with to, uh, to allow me to, to give that talk. But I'll happily um, take any questions now or by all means email me. And I think we've got Catherine Thwaites, who's the International Administration Manager, who could also help with any uh, admin queries that I might be a, a little bit uh, rusty upon. Thank you very much and thank you Mataza. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. I think it was uh, quite interesting. Um, we'll take questions for around 10 minutes, if that's okay. Yes, I'm perfectly fine about that. Dr. Neeraj, can you enable questions if people want to ask? Dr. Neeraj? 
Uh, people are raising the hand. There is Dr. Darshil, I think, who wants to ask the question. Uh, I've just looked, I'm looking at the, the, the chat box here, just to answer a couple of ones there. Uh, uh, I think Catherine's uh, uh, answering the first one, uh, typing. The second one, MRCS, is it a mandatory prerequisite for RCS ed? Um, uh, an MRCS or equivalent for the international postgraduate degree. It do, so an MRCS from either uh, ourselves or one of our sister colleges, in other words, Ireland, England or Glasgow, that's, that's, that's straight away. Um, is it, uh, or equivalent, I've already hinted at the MS in India is something that I accept or we accept. Uh, an MS from Sri Lanka is also something that we accept. Um, so uh, an MRCS or its equivalent is mandatory. I think uh, Alafia is uh, typing the next one. Um, can I take a uh, off beat? Yes, you can. Um, uh, that's that. I'm happy to obviously to take any verbal questions. Um, uh, I think uh, they cannot ask verbally because it's a webinar. Right, right, sorry, sorry. I'll, 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 I'll certainly answer. Uh, when are we supposed to do epic verification? Sorry, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure what epic verification is. I apologise for that. Should one apply through? for the training through the deanery if I have family of two to support. Um, you, you can certainly apply. Uh, you're applying through the deanery uh, for a training post. Uh, uh, you can, you know, there's, there's no, no problem whatsoever in terms of, of, uh, of uh, uh, any dependence that you have. Uh, certainly not from our point of view. There might, it might be, uh, there, might be uh, there might be something in terms of your visa. I don't know, because obviously for your family to come to the UK, uh, uh, it might depend on your visa side of things, but uh, if you've got a family of two to support, well, I'd say you, the salary that you'll get is roughly £45,000 uh, per year. Um, you might be able to save on that and still be able to support uh, uh, your family. So if I clear FRCS Trauma International exam, well, I get GMC. Um, um, uh, I'm I'm not sure that uh, that you uh, about the, the that uh, in terms of um, orthopedics. Um, I don't know whether Matazi could you could help with that. Um, um, if I can, I think that this is about the FRCS international exam. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not very clear myself. I think there's a lot of confusion about that, but I I think that it is not recognised for. Uh, Further UK jobs, as far as I know, it is not, okay. so it is not I recognized. It is, it is not, I think so. Yes, so right. I think it, it is, is an exam that you would probably do, and then probably you know sort of practice in India with it. I guess. Yeah, but so it I, is, it's not recognized yeah. for the GMC registration. It is, yeah. it is not I, recognized, but it uh, if I say uh, overseas would help regarding securing a job somewhere in Asia, East, girl, Middle East. It yeah. has offers some advantage, but not necessarily as a consultant in UK. I just uh, had one uh, uh, question, um, uh, he, uh, Stuart for Stuart, really. You mentioned uh, these two-year uh, fellowship programs. Uh, would, would they lead to some kind of exit exam? And would it be the, the normal FRCS that uh, is given in the UK, or would it be an FRCS international? Um, they, 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 they don't in themselves lead to eligibility to sit an FRCS exam. It's, it, it's, it, yes, it can, it demonstrates that you've done two years of training, uh, but it doesn't in itself lead you directly to, to be able to sit an FRCS. It, it's, 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 that would be part of your overall training experience. So it might be part of your portfolio that you've done these number of operations in a training environment, but it doesn't directly lead to eligibility to sit an exit examination.
And uh, just one more question. Would it, uh, uh, could you extend the fellowship after two years or is it just a fixed two year kind of thing? Um, it, the, the fellowship is, 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 is ideally for 12 to 24 months. Um, what you do after your 24 months is, is, is as it were, up to you. Um, uh, there might be constraints uh, depending upon the visa that you've uh, come to the UK with, because certainly some of the visas obviously are two year limited and uh, uh, don't allow you to take up a permanent post. Uh, but uh, we do know that people change their visas afterwards and then go on to another job in the UK. So we do know that that happens, but that would be out with the deanery. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there's some more questions. Um, Catherine, Catherine's doing well. She's answering lots of questions. Uh, and as uh, uh, Dr. Southwick talks about there, I wish to do shoulder specialist training. Uh, um, uh, I, I think you might, my answer to that is that you might know people in the, uh, the UK that be, uh, might be able to give you uh, uh, posts in the UK and you can uh, come to the UK and get training through the deanery in that respect, or you might ask the deanery through the, the, the second uh, uh, programme, uh, second pathway there to try and uh, get you to find a post. Um, but uh, I think that uh, I, would, I would probably use your, your, your contacts in, in, in India uh, there to, uh, to 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 use them to say which unit they know they know of might be able to provide that uh, training approach them directly uh, and and um, and and see if there's, there's an opportunity there that you can utilize through the contacts you might have in, in in India and we would help you facilitate that what is the level of surgery one would would get to speak to you uh, that was somebody's there as the level of surgical involvement. You, you're there to get trained. I've emphasized that. So from that point of view, you're not there just to be an assistant. Uh, you, you, you equally, you're not there to do independent practice either. You're there to have supervised training experience. So uh, I, I specifically look for that in a job description that it's, uh, that, that it's uh, going to be a uh, training under supervision so it's not just assistance and but nor is it independent practice you will not be in you will still be uh, practicing uh, uh, on behalf of a consultant and on, on behalf of the the the, the trust that uh, that are, are responsible for you so i have a d auth and have three years experience what what option have i to do the fellowship um uh, uh, I'm not sure what a D auth is, Murtaza. Do, do you, uh, you might be able to help me with that. What, what's what's a D auth? Uh, it's not it's not a, um, a so qualification I'm familiar with. Uh, D auth. Yes. Is it the one D auth? It's a diploma in orthopedics. Diploma in orthopedics. Yeah. It's <laughs> um, it's a one and a half years. Is it? Two yeah, years. Two years two course years. in orthopedics. Two years course that gives you a diploma in orthopedics. So yeah. basically, it's like what a less than an MS. is a recognized post for recognized post of training, and yeah, rather than degree, you can uh, submit it to uh, GMC or particular colleges saying that you are trained for four post, rather than the diploma degree as such. But it is not equivalent to MS orthopedics. It is one year less than MS. Mm. Okay, um, uh, in which case, if, if it's if I see a qualification that I'm not familiar with, in other words, like the DOF, then then I would look at the curriculum that's involved in that, and I would look at the examinations that are involved in in a, a getting that qualification, because I uh, the GMC want me to uh, to review those to be able to say that they've sat an examination which has involved basic surgical sciences, which obviously most of them do, and, but also an examination that, uh, 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 that's involved examining patients 
and assessment of basic surgical conditions. So that's very similar to obviously to what a, an OSCE is in, a, in an MRCS. So if, if, if the deal has an examination that's got that within them, then yes, I would accept that as equivalent to an MRCS. And on that basis, yes, I would accept that as a, as a possible means of, uh, of entry uh, through the International Postgraduate DMU Training Programme. I think um, I think we've covered a lot of the questions. Um, I think uh, should we wrap it up now? Is that okay? Uh, I'm happy to. As I say, I, I know there is uh, through the deanery. There is there is uh, the uh, admin team uh, are, are very experienced in in dealing with uh, uh, communications and, and queries from all over the world. Uh, they they're still uh, they're, as much as though they've been furloughed a wee bit, uh, that's uh, uh, as a were part-time almost as a result of COVID, the, the, the college is still open for all um, uh, queries in relation to this. So by all means, send anything to them or any queries you have uh, or, or to me through the, again through that channel and I'll happily uh, uh, answer them as best as I can as they, as they, as they cross your mind uh, after this um, webinar. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, especially uh, Catherine and uh, Stuart for joining us from the UK. And also a special thanks to uh, Chanu and uh, Umesh, and obviously to Dr. Neeraj from Ortho TV for the technical support. Uh, I, think it's, it, uh, I think it will be very useful to everybody. And uh, if anybody has queries, you can send it to my email or Catherine, if that's okay, and uh, or directly to the college, and we'll get back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hello, Catherine speaking, Stuart Clark. I, I, we got there in the end in a roundabout way, didn't we? Uh, a wee, wee bit frustrating at the beginning there. I, uh, I was going around in circles. I switch it off again, switch it on again. Oh, try this, try that. Um, but no, uh, we, we got something worked out. Thank you very much for all your, your help and effort there. I didn't, I didn't see how many participants there were there, did you? Mm -hmm. All right, okay. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, I kept on going. Oh, Catherine Thwaites is typing. Catherine Thwaites is typing. I thought, good on you. You he's, he's say you say saving me a lot of chat. But um, yes, I noticed you noticed you doing all that. So thanks very much for your help. Uh, it was much appreciated. Um,
Um, yeah, and, and in real time as well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, as, as, as you're probably doing there, so you, you can answer questions as, as, as you go rather than just having sort of a 50 to deal with in the last 10 minutes and you're quickly rushing through them all. And obviously some, some you know, by answering them at the time, then you're, then you're preempting a lot of other questions that might come along as well. So I think I think I do. I think that works well. Yeah, I like the phrase tag teamers. Yes, that's good. Um, no, well, I thanks very much for all your help there. And sorry, I didn't mean to give you a panic right at the beginning by going around in circles a wee bit. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I'm on a really steep learning curve for that, and I, I thought I thought that was I thought that was doing not so badly. But every time I come across something, I think, oh, oh. yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. No, I agree. Yeah. No, it's no, it's it's fine. Don't worry. It's, it's a pleasure. Happy to do it any time. If you get if you get any, if you get any more off, off, offers, just sort of problem my way. It's not a problem. Okay. Thanks again, Catherine. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. Uh, of uh, a in both commas likeness, curve of both commas, uh, of the left side of a head uh, with dizziness, particularly on turning her to the to the left. 
At times, this also initiated some pain. Uh, uh, these symptoms were accompanied by a feeling of something being loose uh, in the muscles. Uh, uh, in and around the uh, temporomandibular joint. And a sensation of uh, uh, pain and tenderness uh, in the region of the left submandibular gland. You have a note. Uh, this is showing the scene there, ENT and neurosurgery. I've had CT scans and MRI scans. Uh, and MRI scans, brackets, I'm not sure of the precise areas investigated, but I suspect uh, it would be brain and middle ear, close brackets, and I believe these have been normal. Uh, new paragraph. Uh, Mrs. Cheyenne, I believe, uh, took amitriptyline uh, at a low but steadily increasing uh, dose. Uh, and uh, after some initial uh, benefit from this, had to stop uh, the amitriptyline because of the, the inc increasingly sedative side effects. Uh, new paragraph. Uh, Mr. Shine's uh, symptoms are not worse through uh, eating or chewing or movements of a mandible. There are only very occasional noises. Uh, from the left temple and mandibular joint, there are no uh, there is no history of locking on the right side is uh, a, a, asymptomatic. You have overall the symptoms are, are interfering with her ability uh, to look after her uh, young twin children. You have examination reveals minimal tenderness of the left temporal mandibular joint. Out with this, the rest, the remainder of the examination was essentially normal. There was no the specific tenderness of the muscles and masticulation. Uh, Mrs. Sharon demonstrated a normal, good class one occ uh, occlusion with no deviations on opening or closing. There was no tenderness of the sternified muscle, muscle muscles of the neck. The submandibular gland was uh, normal to palpate, uh, and the mucosa within the mouth was normal. There was no cervical lymphadenopathy. New paragraph. Uh, in addition to speaking to Mrs. Sharon, I was able to talk to her husband by telephone, who was waiting outside the consultation due to COVID-19 restrictions uh, within the Alexandra Hospital. New paragraph. Uh, whilst Mrs. Sharon has some minimal tenderness about the uh, joint, There was no significant uh, uh, a minimal amount of tenderness uh, and subsequently dysfunction of the temporal mandibular joint. I do not believe there is any specific any specific component relating to her uh, main symptoms of concern, namely the lightness, the dizziness, uh, and the sensation of something loose. You've had uh, local measures such as is already undertaken in terms of uh, uh, topical or oral non steroidals in the pre auricular region, or the use of a co warm compress would help the local symptoms, but I do not believe this. So it is obviously of no benefit.
to the rest of the symptoms.